Hello, Timmy Nafso here with the Embedded Podcast at Fortis. We are filming from Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay at the Electronic Transaction Association. Enjoy the series as we interview thought leaders about all things payments, the past, the present, and the future. Welcome to Embedded. Timmy Nafso here. I have JR, Jen Reidenbacher here with me. CMO, Stacks Payments. I've known you for a very long time, Jen. <laughs> Over 30 years of marketing experience, including a decade in the payments industry, holding senior level marketing leadership roles with Evercommerce, Paysafe, iPayment, Cayenne, building and leading growth focused performance marketing teams. Welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Timmy. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, we're, I mean, by the way, we know each other more yeah. than a lot of the people I've spoken to. Yeah. <laughs> Any excuse to chat with you. <laughs> I love even it. If it's a, even if it's a podcast, I will do it. We I jump at the it. chance. You're the best. And thank you for all of the years of knowing you and your guidance. Oh, no, I appreciate um, it. JR, is that like what you can like call the me thing JR. is? Or is it always Jen? That stuck, like, that stuck at iPayment because if you recall, we had a, a CIO whose name was Jennifer and she was there first. So uh, I got the JR, but I used to have that kind of in high school. Okay. Jennifer's a popular name for, it I is. think, uh, people of my age, certainly. Um, and uh, JR, Jen, I, I respond to pretty much anything. Yeah, I'm Tim, Tim, <laughs> yeah. Timothy, T. Uh, J- you know, Jimmy created names for me when I was young as well. So that's a lot of fun, too. Um, so, Jen. No, it's fine. <laughs> so tell us how you got into the payment industry. I mean, you were a marketer. 30 yep. years, like we've said, and then the last decade or so has shifted over to payments. Yeah, I mean, the beginning of my career, I kind of fell into marketing after school and uh, knew I had a passion for it, knew I loved it. Um, I love the variety of it. And I had spent the early part of my career in a variety of different industries, everything from corporate relocation to real estate uh, to consumer packaged goods. I was a part of the early adoption team or kind of launch team at Keurig. Nice. Um, way before it was a consumer product. And I was kind of looking for something. And ironically, a woman that I met at Remax was working for what was then Merchant Warehouse. She was actually Henry Halkison's EA. And she reached out to me about an opportunity to join the marketing team. And she said, you know, what you see on the line is not where we're headed directionally. This is a really interesting space. I think you'd really love the team here. Um, so she was able to push through my resume and got me an interview. And I met Henry and, and met some of the team, and I was just so inspired by what they were doing at the company. And I think that's what really caused me to pull in. Um, you know, we were at the time evolving from what was a traditional ISO into a true technology company. We then, you know, I had the opportunity once I joined to rebrand that company from Merchant Warehouse to Cayenne. Yes. And then, as I think most in the payments industry know, you know Henry was able to successfully uh, sell that company for a billion dollars to, at the time, TSIS, now Global TSIS. So yes, yeah. it was, um, and, and from the first moment, I was really just intrigued by, I think, the diversity of it, the challenge of it. I loved a multi channel environment, which is kind of what I started out with Cayenne. Um, not only were we building our own tech stack and our own gateway, but we were working across a direct business, an agent business, and an ISV business. And, you know, I just really enjoyed kind of the energy and the passion and then just understanding and learning about the complexity of payments. I think as consumers, we tap our card or, you know, we swipe or way back, we used to use the knuckle busters. And we take for granted everything that goes on behind. And I think, you know, we're certainly, you know, we're, recording from Transact. And this is really a show that's all about kind of the layers and the connection points that need to happen between companies of all sizes to process that transaction and allow and create kind of opportunities around commerce and power commerce for you know our global economy. Absolutely. And today it brings you to Stacks. I am. I and am. Tell us a little bit about that and what that looks like from your first payment company you were at until what you know today. It's funny, when I started in payments, Stax wasn't even around. Um, Stax started uh, about 10 years ago. We'll be celebrating our 10 year in, ju- in July. And it started as a disruptor on kind of what, the, what I classify as the B to SMB space. So digital acquisition from a marketing perspective, very common in our space, yep. um, really enabling small businesses to accept payments. Um, where Stax was very different, and admittedly, I used to compete against them at other companies that I worked for, um, was they built tech around it. So they weren't just reselling terminals or a cloud-based system. 
they were actually building technology so that they gave businesses kind of a business management light. We've got some invoicing, we've got a little bit of a light CMS, and they, unlike, you know, one of the big complaints that I think one of the challenges we've had is the pricing structures around payments are very complicated, very confusing for small businesses. There's oftentimes just a lot of kind of, there's just a lot of layers and it's a laundry list of things. And Stacks revolutionized it by saying, we're actually not gonna do that. We're gonna charge a subscription. So we're really a payments as a service company. That's really the way we go to market yeah. on the direct side. And then talking with kind of the incoming CEO who, full disclosure, I worked for and with at Paysafe, I was really excited about the opportunities of where Stacks was heading as a company. You know, today Stacks is, you know, similar to Cayenne, we're a multi-channel environment. Yeah. Um, we have a, a flourishing, you know, direct business and that's kind of where we cut our teeth. But we have over the last kind of four to five years really evolved into the integrated space um, across three primary verticals, field service, uh, healthcare, specialized healthcare, and um, professional services. Yeah. And we're doing some really unique things um, around creating very vertically tailored, but not completely bespoke by customer solutions to allow us to deliver just a better experience for ISV partners and then a better experience for their downstream customers. Yeah, technology has certainly allowed us to shift from this and marketing, yeah. obviously, from this, you know, we need a bunch of ISOs or resellers to go out and reach the uh, businesses, which eventually gets us to the consumer, to now what we're hearing you know, 10 years later, it's no, we, we are directly going and we're, we're tailoring for those groups as well, because we can't be everything to everybody. It is. I mean, you know, Fortis is in this space as well. Obviously, yeah. you know, Paysafe was in this space, Cayenne's in the space. I think the world of, you know, to shift gears and kind of talk about embedded and integrated, the value proposition for, I think technology has done multiple things. One is it has really brought, I think, opportunity for new starts and for established companies to develop vertically tailored business management solutions, yeah. which then presents more opportunity for payments companies to embed and add value through kind of a more holistic solution. Right. Um, and for people to, I mean, you know, we have we have a company, um, we have a company that kind of is a, a whole co, if you would, that has a variety of brands. One of the brands that we service is a brand called Duty Calls. And literally it's a whole software system around people that go and clean up people's yards for them yes. that have pets. I mean, it's a, it's a flourishing business. Yeah. And it's like, this is, kind of the like the specialization that we can provide. And I think it, it's, we don't wanna be everything to everyone. And from a technology perspective, we've also, you know, a lot of companies in this space really service as, still service as a broker. You know, they're a connector and they'll build a layer of technology. Stacks bought a company uh, last year called Atlantic Pacific Processing. So we are actually standing up our own backend processor. So we, we will become, we are on a path and part of our evolution to become an end-to-end -end processor, which is very unique for a company of our size and something Absolutely. that we're really excited about. And it's not necessarily about, it's, it's about control, but not in a way of strangulation. It's a control about creating these vertically tailored kind of really unique experiences for very specific groups of customers yeah. um, so that we can really deepen our partnerships and just add more value. Absolutely. It's a hard thing to do. I mean, you imagine in a world where you want to catch everything yep. and we're being asked as we continue to grow, you kind of got to pick. Yep. If everybody's your customer, nobody's your customer. 100%. And that's really true. And when we say over like the last five years or so, I mean, we all experienced COVID and so on and so forth. What trends uh, have kind of evolved that we may have thought were going to be something that didn't end up panning out the way we thought it was or and <laughs> something that did happen the way that you anticipated or saw it. Occur. You know, I think I think for for me, I mean, it, it struck us all in a different way. Um, I think for us at, at the time, I was with Paysafe, um, so we had a variety of different business units that we would com we needed to communicate with, and our value proposition was really different in how we helped them kind of navigate through COVID, but we took on a much more direct responsibility than I think we had ever done before. It actually enhanced our opportunity to be of value. Um, you know, in the US, we were kind of facilitating and helping them find access to their to their loans, their, their PSP loans. Um, in Europe, we were trying to find different ways for them to enable and think about, you know, multi more multi-channel opportunities. Absolutely. Um, so I think for us, it opened a lot of opportunity, but the marketing side of it became increasingly complex because 
you know, businesses weren't necessarily in a buy cycle from the SMB perspective. And our value in our offering had to be different than what it had been for, quite frankly, the last 10 years. Absolutely. And it really stimulated us. You know, I think about all this. I go back to like my hometown and I think about all the all the companies and restaurants that didn't offer takeout or, you know, didn't have curbside. Yes. And then I think at the macro level from a payments perspective, and this is really U.S. specific, quite frankly, it pushed us. It, it pulled us forward to get more contactless adoption, you know, beyond kind of the, the walled garden apps like an Uber or Starbucks, our contactless rates were pretty much abysmal right before the pandemic. And it really did force Americans to start leveraging kind of the technology that was there and create, you know, a more frictionless checkout experience. Yeah, we, we felt we certainly were behind on, yeah. you know, 1992. I always use a statistic that, you know, EMV was so new in 2015 <laughs> and in, it was France in 1990. It was out. Yeah. Like, so like we, you know, you would, I went to Italy and I would hand, I wouldn't hand them my card and they would come back. They'd bring the terminal yeah. to you right 100%. there. And now that's become part of our it's environment. It's standard practice. Exactly. I mean, I, I was on a, I was at an event and I, I not going to name the card brand, but we were at, um, like an innovation think tank that they were putting on and hosting for us. And one of the gentlemen had just come over from Australia and he was saying, and this was, oh gosh, probably almost 10 years ago. He was saying that contactless was 97% wow. of payments in Australia. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, I don't think we're at 0.97%, yeah. you know, at Absolutely this right. point at the time. Absolutely right. Um, we were still in the midst of, you know, EMV and, and getting the cards out and uh, helping educate. So it's, you know, I think that's what makes the payment space so fun is even in times of crisis, the community comes together and we still keep the customer kind of at the focus and the core of what we're doing. And we do help drive optimization around commerce. And I think that it's just it's it's a privilege. It's an honor. It's a responsibility. And it's just a boatload of fun. Yeah, we've seen um, this you know new emergence yeah. also over the last five years of back to the old style of sales reps. Yep. The new sales rep or ISO has now become the software. Yep. You mentioned, you know, software as a service or it's payments a as a service. Blurred lines. Very blurred <laughs> lines. There is some information out there that talks about how software companies are doing a better job at payments than payment companies are doing at software. So we're seeing a lot of this new focus on making sure that there is a software aspect to yep. the business, that there is this commoditized approach to just what used to be merchant services, yep. the merchant services industry. From your perspective, the challenge as a marketer yeah. to reach not only software companies, right, but also whoever those pull through downstream yeah. merchants are, what are you experiencing from that perspective in this new age? Because uh, by the way, post COVID, you can't, it's hard to mail something to somebody. You have no, no uh, idea where they're yeah, located people, at this point. Yeah, yeah. it is. And, and you know, remote, remote work, remote living. Yeah. I mean, I think back to like when I started in the market and even, I think there's two things I want to touch on here. One is the question at hand, which is kind of post COVID impact. It's hard because in the direct side of the business for SMB, they're shopping on price and they're typically shopping for now. Yeah. Most, you know, SMBs aren't thinking about what they're going to need to do in 30 days. They're actually, they need it tomorrow. Exactly right. Um, so it's, it's marketing and getting the value proposition baked into that. And I think how we've really implemented that is a lot of A-B testing. Um, you know, we can think we know what's going to respond and, and what's going to engage a customer, but you can't, you don't know until, and, and that's an iterative process. That is not a one and done. I think also just arming and training our sales reps to be much more consultative. You know, don't rush to the close, ask the questions, find value, even though price is the primary decision maker for a lot of certainly SMBs, um, be thoughtful and be a business partner for yeah, them. Absolutely. You know, we want to be a resource. We don't want to be a commodity that's a, you know, we have you on our books for, you know, 12 months and then you're on to the next person. First of all, it's very disruptive for the merchant. You know, I sit on a committee with ETA and yesterday we were talking about this because we've spent a lot of time talking about technology and like the hardware and the infrastructure and the backside of it. But our focus needs to be on as we're rolling out technology as an industry, how can we think about education and value and activation and the power and activation and how they can use this to actually save time in running their business. And I think like payments has been it has been missing that. So I think that's for us really, really important. The ISB side um, of the business and the partnership side and integration, I think it's just, I think really the demand has been to be, have more flexibility, 
more optionality from a program perspective. I mean, with integrated, there's always the piece of we're connecting our software. You know, we've got large competitors in the space that make that very, very simple in many yep. cases, but it's more than that. It's the people, it's the process, and it's the technology. And I stole that from my our new CTO, but I love it. Um, and I think it really applies. He talks about it in terms of our team structure, but I, I brought that forward because I think it's really important for us to think about that. Um, when many companies are pulling back on resources, you know, for example, we can offer any type of program, you know, manage payback, payback, um, we can allow our ISVs to resell, we can do a referral program, we have that expertise because yeah. obviously we have the direct business. So it's been exciting to be able to have discussions with partners, but the demands are more. You know, certain people want you know faster payments, um, embedded finance, which is really hitting us hard. You know, we've talked to a few people here and that's definitely a hot topic now. I think we have a different responsibility um, to become an extension and really an extension of the software that we're working with. Absolutely. Um, and really a true partnership and not be a vendor. And I think that's a, you know, I think it's, it, it, we have to turn this whole conversation from a transaction to an interaction. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we always thought about or what would I want for my business yeah. coming from an entrepreneurial background is in, in, the, in the payment ecosystem, the finance ecosystem, it's very common that you have the phone number to your attorney, you have the oh, phone yeah. number to your accountant, you have the phone number to say your landscaper, as a matter yep. of fact. But you're, once it's time to get a hold of who is moving 80, 90, 100% of your funding, there's yeah. nobody there. Um, and we absolutely believe that this time more than ever, there's a longing yep. for that type of experience, for a personalized, tailored approach 100%. to everything in the ecosystem. <laughs> And, and you've got to be there for your customer. I mean, yeah. like I, I mentioned earlier, I think that so often we forget, yes, we're all in here in, in this business to make money. Sure. You know, revenue and EBITDA, um, you know, value ROI from a marketing perspective. We're always looking at ROI. Um, but I think we all have to reflect on the responsibility that we have. And when something happens and a small business can't accept payments, for example, the impact that that has to their business, to their livelihood, they might not be able to make payroll. Right. You know, they may not be able to buy the new things. They might not be able to open their doors. Exactly right. And I think so often we forget, you know, it's a big responsibility that we take on in this space. And I think it's it's humbling, but it's also super exciting. Yeah. Um, but I have to, you know, we have to remind ourselves of that, I think, more often than not. We are important. That we is are. what we're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. e even when people think payments is not the sexiest it is, thing. It is important. Um, it's it necessary. It is critical. <laughs> it's critical. Well, I mean, that was one of the things, actually, breaking it up again. Yeah. That was one of the things that happened during the pandemic, is Homeland Security actually essentially classified payments companies as being part of essential services. Yeah. So, because we had to be there to help these businesses that we power Exactly right. Enable commerce. I mean, we're, we're, we're vital to the economy on a Absolutely. worldwide global basis. Yeah, 100%. So I'm going to go back to the A-B testing comment, yep. and we're going to tie that a little bit to marketing and AI. I love it. So um, here we are today, and we have understood that there's this AI thing, <laughs> artificial intelligence, and we go back they, to the movie they, in 2015 see, with Will Smith. Yep. Right? <laughs> and there's going to be a robot that's going to take over everything, and that's everybody's image of what AI is. So <laughs> it, it's we, either it's either the beast or it's the best. I, I yeah, don't know, depending, but I think more yeah. people lean on the beast of you know it's going to take away jobs, it's going to yes. ruin your life, you're giving too much information into the cloud. Um, is AI smarter than we are as human beings? Yeah. Um, you know, I think for us from a marketing perspective, um, we've had fun with it. You know, we're, we've bought a couple tools. Um, we use a tool called Copy, Copy AI. There's yeah. a tool called Jasper that does, there's probably a hundred tools. And there'll probably be 150. You're utilizing yeah, these today. That, that are began. out there available. Yeah. And you mentioned A-B testing. One of the ways that we do it is, you know, say we have a, a copy piece, a blog piece or a podcast or something else, we'll script that out. And then we can use Copy AI to give us add concepts and yes. A-B options with tone or however we want to look at kind of the difference. And I love that versatility. It also forces you, I think being a marketer, it's challenging. It doesn't matter how great you are at marketing. It's challenging to sometimes look at it from the outside in. And I think Copy AI gives us that. It's like, even if you don't use it, the suggestion is like, might say, create an aha moment yes. of, oh, I never thought about positioning this copy piece that way. So I think it's, I, I look at it as really a valuable tool and, you know, A-B testing, it helps us a lot, but also helps us, you know, we might have some dated copy. 
we throw it in there and just get a different perspective. And it's not, we still have human interaction with that, yes. yep. but it's a tool, you it's know, tool. it's an arrow in our quiver. I don't look at it as it's going to replace my copy, you know, our copy person's job or PR job or whatever it may be. I mean, I, I think it actually just allows them enhances. to fill their plate yep. more. So now instead of spending more time to say just writing, now they're reviewing more, yep. editing and pushing out more. Now I could do one piece of content yep. a week. I could do five with this, 100%. this, this AI. And, and, I, and I think it's just, you know, I don't, I don't think people realize, you know, I, you, obviously you see the news and you see all these stories and it's certainly impacting different industries in different ways. Um, I know the fast food industry has been, you know, QSR has been specifically kind of at bay between robotics and AI and how do you use this stuff? Because they're really connected. You talked yes. about it earlier with the Will Smith reference. But I look at it and go, this is a this is really something that helps us enable to be better. I think we're already using it. Like there's a resistance group to AI and it's like if you're texting someone you're using it whether you ask to be using it or not because it's giving you this suggestion. If you're typing in, you know, a Microsoft product or a Google product, it's giving you the suggestion. Absolutely. So I I see a lot of power in it and I think it makes us better and it um, it gives us a perspective. And it's what you put in. So, you know, if you want to change what AI is giving you, you have to contribute and be a part of the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so over the next five years or so, uh. this is, here we are at ETA. What is innovation going to look like with the, you know, AI is here. Yeah. And this is just the prediction that we could look back and if you were right, we'd be like, see, <laughs> we were right. No so, pressure. No pressure. We'll come back at the Transact 2029 year. and see how we feel about this podcast. Um, you know, I think... AI will be much more pro, like proliferated in the in the in the empowering and helping us power our businesses Absolutely. as as part of the ecosystem. I mean, I think that it'll be. I don't think it'll replace jobs. I think it'll be still a tool that helps create efficiency and opportunity. Um, I do think it will continue to grow and probably have some regulations around it. Yeah. Um, I think some of the biggest pieces are going to be around. You know, certainly on the integrated space, I talked about it, embedded finance, I think is a really important one. Um, you know, time to revenue and time to cash is so important for many of the verticals that we look to work in and, and we work in today. So I think the more opportunity we can provide people to get, you know, I always talk about field service, a contractor that's coming to my house that may have, this, this may be a very successful contractor, they probably don't have $500,000 cash in their piece. So getting a deposit and being able to get that money today versus two days from now or next day even is a game changer for them. Big time. You know, day, like that time is revenue to them. It is. And there's a value to that. Um, I also think that there'll be ongoing changes. I mean, I, you know, Amazon obviously just shut down a lot of their self-checkout, but they're now, you know, really leveraging kind of biometrics. I think there'll be a lot of continued evolution, even more so than we've seen. And we've seen a lot um, of the last five years. I think we'll see a lot more in the next five years around what the checkout experience really is from the consumer perspective, regardless of what industry you're in. That could be field service. That could be specialized healthcare is one that we spend a lot of time in. I mean, you talked about mobility and being able to take a payment from anywhere and any type. And then customer choice is just huge. I mean, we've been talking about, you know, APMs and the checkout experience and BMPL for a while. And there's got to be a world that you know, we're servicing a generation that has grown up with devices and connectivity and choice. I mean, I always use the, and I'm going to date myself on this one. I always use this example, though, when I'm describing it to someone. When I was a kid and someone said, if you said to me, hey, Jen, will you grab me a Gatorade when you're out at the store? I'd go in, I'd grab the Gatorade, it was one flavor, one SKU, yeah. and I'd bring it back to you and say, enjoy, Timmy. Yeah, uh, now you go into a store and there's a whole aisle of Gatorade <laughs> to choose from. And that's just the Gatorade yeah. brand. That's yeah. not Powerade and all the other you know, tangential products and competitors. So I think we have to meet our consumers where they're at. And you know, I love to come here and see everything that's, like, there's so many innovations right now. This is such an exciting space. There's such an energy here in Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, and I, I get excited. I, I geek out about it and think about it, not just from a consumer perspective, but you know, then how we can kind of continue to build our businesses and, and really drive more value. Yeah, that is awesome. Embedded, right? It was it is. 10 years ago, we talked about integrated. Yeah. And is now shifted to embedded. And I like the change commerce. in that word, to be yeah, honest with I you. I, I, 
I really like, I mean, the integration to me is the technology of how you connect the technology, but embedded really speaks in the spirit of partnership. Yes. And that's where you really, you know, ISVs have a lot to, a lot of value that they can drive from embedded payments, not just in terms of their customer experience, but obviously in terms of their revenues mm -hmm. and their ability to grow and accelerate their growth. And, you know, I, that to me just feels really good to be able to be a part of that and, and help awesome. other companies, uh, you know, experience kind of the, the growth trajectory that I've been able to have the privilege of doing in, in multiple times in the payment space. Jan? To me, this was so this much was fun. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I could talk to you for you three more hours. I know we could no. actually, by the way. I will ask you one more question just for fun. You've traveled a lot. I know this. I have. You've been to a lot of different places, a lot of different countries, whether personal or work. What is your favorite place? I, it no. may be Detroit. I'm going to just set that aside for a quick second. I did, I did go to a Super Bowl there. There so you that go. Would, See, that, there you that, go. And it was my beloved Steelers. So that was a very special <laughs> trip. Awesome. Um, but where is your favorite place uh, in the world to visit? You know, it's probably someplace I haven't been. I've always wanted to go to Australia and I haven't okay. been there. So I, I put that on the list. I think the favorite place, the, the most, it's hard to pick, but I will say I have a special place in my heart for Vienna. I had the opportunity to travel there um, when I was with PaySafe, and um, I was just awestruck by its beauty, um, its progressiveness. Um, you know, I have a real appreciation for Europe in general because I think I had the opportunity to live there and do a short-term assignment there very early on in my career. And I think it was that moment where I was like, okay, Europeans, you know, <laughs> work to live. And as Americans, we've kind of crossed back on that and we flipped that and we, yeah. we live to work. Yeah. And I really do appreciate the pace and the partnership and, and just the, the mindset of kind of uh, some of our European uh, brethren. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so today. much. Thanks this was a pleasure. Us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Cheers. You're the best. Thanks. All right, bye. <laughs> oh, we're going to hug you that. No, we're going to hug you that.